Well, welcome. We're glad you've joined us for the first in our uh, series uh, for our 2023 economic forecast. We've partnered with uh, Beacon Economics and Dr. Christopher Thornburg to provide our members with what we hope is going to be very valuable uh, information. Uh, my name is Roger Ballard. I have the privilege of being the CEO for New Vision Credit Union, and we're really uh, happy to have our member owners be part of this uh, webinar uh, today. Uh, so again, we're glad you're here. We'll, we appreciate you taking time with us. You know, here at New Vision Credit Union, in addition to providing uh, great products and exceptional personalized service through our outstanding team members, we also really believe that uh, an important part of serving our members is providing you access to the best economic and financial insights to help you make it a more informed decision and really be better prepared to make the right financial decisions for your lives uh, particularly this year, I think we're hearing a lot of uh, narratives about uh, with different perspectives, depending on what news sources you might listen to or read about. So one of the ways that we, we here at New Vision um, want to show our appreciation to our members is by investing in expert resources to help you uh, build your life. And that's why we've partnered again with Beacon Economics and Dr. Uh, Chris Thornburg uh, to do just that. So with this webinar today, it's going to be really in, in kind of three distinct uh, sections that Chris is going to go into. And that's first is, how did we get here from an economic perspective? How did we get here? Where are we heading from here on out? And what about the housing market, which we know is important to many of our members? So with that, let me just uh, take a moment, uh, and, and Chris asked me to use the, the, the condensed version of his bio because he's quite the, the qualified person that you have with us. We're really fortunate to have him uh, with us today. Christopher Thornburg, he founded Beacon Economics LLC in 2006. He's an expert in economic and revenue forecasting, regional economics, economic policy, and labor and real estate markets. Dr. Thornburg, AKA Chris, that's what he prefers, he told me, uh, has consulted for private industry, cities, uh, as well as you know, many others, uh, in, including public agencies. Uh, he became nationally known for forecasting the subprime mortgage market crash that began in 2007 and was one of the few economists on record to predict the global economic recession that followed. So he definitely knows what he's talking about, and we're really pleased and honored to have him with us uh, this afternoon. And uh, with that, I'd like to say, Chris, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Roger. I, I appreciate that. It, it is absolutely wonderful to be here. I, I will say I had to smile a little when you said, in case people want to share the slides with their family. Uh, I have a four and a half and a six year half and old. I can't imagine they'd be very interested in my slides. Um, I will also point out I have locked them out of my office, so we will not have any, shall we say, moments of interference on this particular uh, on this particular day. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here uh, with Roger New Vision to discuss what's going on in the economy. And, and as he pointed out, um, please, if you have questions, thoughts as we go through this, get them into those chat box. We're going to have a periodic place to break. I'll also point one other thing out. When we come to those breaks, you're going to see a QR code. And so if you'd be interested in having a copy of these slides, you can have your phone ready, take a standard picture of that QR code, and you'll be able to fill in your email, and we'll get a copy of that out to you. So let's just leap right into it. Of course, when we had this conversation, the big question in everybody's mind was, hey, Chris, what about that recession? Um, and, you know, the, 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 the term I'm calling it, of course, is the Godot recession. That is to say, uh, I think we're going to be waiting a long time for this one to show up, if it shows up at all. Um, now, I appreciate that's a little different than the scary headlines you've been hearing over the last few months, or, or really almost for half a year now, over half a year. Um, you've probably seen uh, some of these out there. Stocks are in a bear market. Housing's in a full-blown correction. 98% chance of a global recession and so on and so forth. Some some very scary things. Now, it's interesting because you've been seeing a lot of scary headlines over the last couple of years. Of course, uh, the last couple of years has been all about the pandemic. Now we're talking about what seems to be a more, shall we say, standard sort of recession. But that does remind me we have to go back before the pandemic. And guess what we see? exactly the same thing. The more things change, the more they stay the same. 
This is a list of those same people making the same recession calls in early 2019. Now, back then, of course, they weren't flipping out about higher interest rates. It was more about, shall we say, uh, the, the Chinese trade war. Uh, some issues, of course, having to do with the fact that interest rates come up a, a bit, but the mar housing market had cooled a lot. So in other words, this constant need to tell us we're about to have a recession is, is certainly nothing new. It's been happening on a pretty regular basis, really since the Great Recession. Now, with that in mind, I, I've been noticing this since the Great Recession. Uh, Roger noted up front that I made a name for myself back in the day calling the Great Recession. And back then, I was called Dr. Doom. And since then, I've been called kind of Dr. Sunshine and Light because for the most part, I've, I've brushed aside these recession calls. Now, I'll tell you, I haven't changed. What's changed is the narrative. And what do I mean by that? Well, the big thing I've learned over the last few years of watching our economy is, well, beware the narrative. Um, and I wouldn't have called that before. In fact, my, my sort of name for the world prior uh, over the last few years has been miserableism, the philosophy of constantly talking about terrible everything because it's not. But it was this book by Robert Schiller called Narrative Economics. It just came out in the last couple of years. Uh, for those of you who might remember, Robert Schiller also famously wrote a book 20 years ago now called The Rational Exuberance that was quite popular. Um, this is one of his newer entrees, shall we say, into it. And what I love about this book is um, it basically helped me better understand this idea of miserableism, this idea that right now the story is always about how bad things are, despite the fact that when you actually look at the underlying realities, realities of our economy, things don't look all that bad. Now, what Schiller pointed out is that, you know, in the typical economics world of today, uh, my field has become very, shall we say, enamored with models and mathematics and everything else, almost to the point, as, as, as Robert Schiller might say, is that we've forgotten the fact that economics is a social science. Inherently, it is about people. That is what it really boils down to. And his point in this book is, is quite simple, that when the stories we tell ourselves are lined up with reality, well, this is a world where we can anticipate that households will make good decisions on saving and spending. Businesses will make good decisions on investment and hiring. And of course, uh, policymakers will pursue, shall we say, worthy goals. But there are plenty of periods of time where the narratives, the stories we tell each other are completely off base from reality. And by the way, these are the interesting points, shall we say, from an economic cycle perspective. Because herein is where we start to see businesses, households, and policymakers pursuing the wrong goals and ultimately creating problems for the overall macroeconomy. Now, over the last decade, the narrative has been all about miserableism, telling us how terrible everything is, despite the fact that the reality says something different. If you go before the Great Recession, it was a different kind of set of narratives, typically narratives that were excessively positive. For example, do we remember back in 1998, where if you had a lousy business plan but slapped .com on the end of it, it was suddenly worth $10 billion? Or how about in 2005, where by using subprime loans, we could all become real estate millionaires overnight? Again, broken narratives that led to bad decisions being made by different groups in our economy, and ultimately it ended up putting us into the middle of the Great Recession. So. How does that sort of say bear out in today? Well, first of all, we know, of course, that there were some bad economic signals coming out of 2022. Uh, real GDP growth slowed down a lot towards the end of the year. University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Survey showed a big decline in consumer confidence. For those of you who follow the bond markets, you might uh, know that the yield curve is inverted right now. For those of you who are wondering what that means, that's what happens when, when high long-run interest rates are actually lower than short-run interest rates. We call that an inverted yield curve. And by the way, that's been a pretty good predictor of a recession. We saw an inverted yield curve in 1989. We saw one in 2000. We saw one in 2006, all, of course, preceded by a recession. Here we are yet again with a very inverted yield curve. And you believe in numerology. Well, this is a pretty good indicator something bad is going to happen. But if you take a step back, let's acknowledge one thing. Here we are at the very start of 2023, and this is not an economy in a recession. Uh, one of the best signs of a recession is slackness in the labor market. People want jobs, but they can't find them. 
Well, we certainly have no slack in our labor market right now. The unemployment rate in the United States is 3.4%. That is the lowest it has been since 1968. So that gives you a sense of, of just how incredibly strong this economy is. Equivalently, look at industrial production, it's still near an all-time high level. This is an economy that's chugging around pretty much at capacity, not a recession. So if you think we're going to have a recession, well, it's going to come at some point later this year. We certainly aren't in one right now. And what about first quarter? Well, as it turns out, of course, the first quarter looks like it's going to be a positive growth rate, according to both the blue chip consensus and the GDP now number. And again, if you've been following the news, you might have heard over the last couple of days that Jay Powell doesn't think we're going to have a recession anymore anyway. That quite the opposite. He seems inclined to believe the economy is still too hot. And he's talking about even more extensive, extensive increases in interest rates. So, yes, very, very confusing. What is going on? Well, let's break it all down and then we'll kind of go through uh, why I believe all this stuff. First of all, the big narrative we've been seeing over the last nine months or so is that a recession is going to happen any second now. Why? Well, again, most of the people who are worried about a recession will tell you the economy is already in a crisis. Now, what crisis, you may ask? Well, it depends on what party you belong to. Uh, one side of the fence will tell you it's inequality and global warming. The other side will tell you it's taxes and regulations. Uh, candidly, they're all wrong. The economy is not in a crisis at the moment, but this is the mentality of our world today. Then, of course, the two big stories of 2022, the things that really got people worried, obviously, it was a big increase in the pace of inflation and, of course, the big hike in interest rates. According to the pessimists, inflation is hurting consumers. Real estate is collapsing because of interest rates. Ergo, we're going to have a recession. We don't believe that at Beacon. We're, in fact, quite the opposite. We think it's highly unlikely for the U.S. economy to tip into a recession in the next couple of years. We expect reasonable, not great, but reasonable growth. Um, and we do so by, first by acknowledging one very important thing. This idea that inflation and interest rates are hurting our economy misses the point. The inflation and rising rates we're seeing today are the consequences of the natural consequences of the excessive amount of stimulus throughout the economy over the course of the pandemic. Um, these are not exogenous shocks. They are actually a symptom of an excessive amount of stimulus. Uh, and as a result of that, what they did was they simply overheated the economy. And what we're feeling today is not an economy tipping into a downturn, but rather going from being heated white hot to something more resembling normality, which is a little bit cooler, and it has to be. What we saw in 2021 was not reasonable, it wasn't sustainable, and it couldn't last. And so what we are simply doing is tipping back to something more normal. Uh, if you're thinking about us having a recession, I, I, I'm a real world economist, that's how I kind of refer to myself. And what that means from my perspective is you're not going to ever see a recession start in the stock market, start in the inflation statistics, or even in the interest rates. Rather, you have to see some real imbalance in our economy, building too many homes, spending, consuming too much at the household level, not saving enough. These are the kind of things that can cause a problem for the economy. And I don't, just don't see any major imbalances today. Now, I do see some weakness. There's no doubt that mortgage rates going from 25 to 7% are going to create some problems in our economy. But our anticipation is there'll be plenty of both consumer demand and business demand, particularly for equipment and software, to more than offset, shall we say, the real estate we're expecting to see in real estate and finance. And as for asset prices, they're going to continue to slowly deflate. But the fundamentals of the assets, which is the thing you really need to worry about, are going to remain decent. Hence, we're not going to have any systemic shall we say, implosion in our financial markets, kind of like what we did back in 2008 and 2009. Now, with all this in mind, it doesn't mean everything's fine and Jim dandy and wonderful. For example, one of our big problems is the fact that the big hike in interest rates is going to collapse the process of what we call filtering, which is going to intensify the housing shortages that are already a problem in the United States. Labor shortages are an enormous issue. And we have, as a nation, we have not really yet gotten around to grasping why this is occurring and what we need to do about it. Well, we really do need to start thinking about it because it's going to become a heavier and heavier weight 
on our economy over the next couple of years. We have public deficit challenges at the state and, of course, at the federal level. We know some of the issues going on right now with the debt ceiling. But let's not also remember that over the last few years, our government has picked up a truly terrifying amount of debt, uh, something on the order of $20,000 for every person in three years. Uh, and But for me, the scariest thing of all is this ongoing gap between the narratives, the stories we're telling each other, and the basic economic realities around us. And this is where we're going to try and head. So as noted, part one, how did we get here? Well, you have to go back to the pandemic, the beginning of 2020. And yes, it was a scary time. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and ended up being obviously tragic. Millions of people died. Lots, Many families are, are still grieving the loss of loved ones. And we're still dealing with it at some level, despite the fact that with all the vaccines and whatnot, it's just not as big of an issue as it was a couple of years ago. But where we went off the rails, where we started seeing this selection of headlines by, yes, you guessed it, the same crew of people who told us there was going to be a recession in 19 and a recession in 2022, came out and told us that this thing was going to blow up the economy like nobody's business. And you got Zandy saying 30% of home loans are going to be defaulted on. And a group out of Colorado said 30 to 40 million people are going to be evicted and so on and so forth. Well, none of this was real. It was nonsensical. No pandemic has ever caused a depression. I don't even can't even imagine why people would say these things out loud, but they did. And you know what? The narrative stuck and Congress responded accordingly. How do they respond? Well, they threw $6.5 trillion in fiscal stimulus at the economy. Let me put that in context. If you actually look what happened over the course of the, the, the uh, pandemic, the economy lost about $1.15 trillion of economic output. In return for our trouble, they lobbed $6.5 trillion in stimulus at us. $6 of fiscal stimulus for every dollar of lost output. That doesn't make any sense. That's not what stimulus is about. Absolute insanity. Now, how do you come up with that money? You can't just go to the bond markets and go from borrowing a trillion to three trillion plus a year. You'd up then things like nobody's business. Well, they didn't have to go to the bond markets. They went to Mr. Powell. Of course, Jerome Powell is currently the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and he more than happily opened up his pocketbook and printed five trillion dollars of brand new cash and gave it to Congress through, of course, quantitative easing, which is when the Federal Reserve buys government debt. Now. You know, you got to keep in mind, this is kind of a new tool. After all, Ben Bernanke did quantitative easing uh, during the course of the Great Recession. Hey, why not, one might ask. But if you really want to know causes of depression, here's the answer. It's a recession combined with deflation. And deflation occurs, of course, when the money supply shrinks. So when you think about Ben Bernanke in his term as the head of the federal chairman, he was facing a true depression-like crisis. We had a lot of real shocks to the economy, collapsing demand by consumers, collapsing demand in the housing market, a collapse space of, of, new, of new construction. And then you had the big issues in the financial markets. Remember, the investment banks going belly up, the bond market seizing up. Well, when financial market starts to seize up, this is what caused deflationary pressure on our economy. And as a result of that, Ben Bernanke had to react, and he did. And he did a hell of a job. So my question right now for Mr. Powell is, what crisis, sir? We had no financial crisis this time around. There were no bank crises. There were no failing, uh, there were no foreclosures, bankruptcies. It just didn't exist. And of course, the difference in terms of its impact on the money supply couldn't have been more profound. This is uh, that orange line there is three-year growth rates in M2. And take a look at the gap between what Bernanke did and what Powell did. Bernanke's $3.5 trillion of quantitative being over six years kept money supply growth steady. Powell's $5 trillion in two years caused one of the biggest surges in money supply we've ever seen. And there's not a mystery here. There's absolutely no mystery. Here's, a, here's another great book. You hear, if you're cruising Amazon for, for fun economics books tonight, if such things exist, this book was written back in the early 1980s, Money and Mischief by Milton Freeman. Fantastic book. I learned more about money and banking and inflation from this book than I ever did from my graduate book. And, and by the way, in the first chapter, you know, money mischief. What happens when you print too much money? Well, he goes through it. The first thing that happens when you throw $5 trillion in fresh cash at any economy is, well, people feel rich. 
Of course you do. You got tons of money in your banking account. So as a result of that, you start to see the economy just sort of take off. Um, people have money. They spend. They invest. Interest rates go down. Asset prices go up. Consumer spending picks up. And of course, business investment picks up behind it. But you know, none of this is real. We have to keep in mind that true wealth in our economy is our ability as a nation to produce goods and services that people want to, of course, actually consume. Now, that's not based on money. It's not based, if you will, on interest rates. It's based on, well, the number of workers you have and how well trained they are and how much machinery you have and infrastructure in your institutions and all this kind of thing. None of those were changed by printing $5 trillion. So, of course, all you've really done is push demand past, if you will, the economy's ability to, to meet that demand. And so the net result of this has to be inflation. If there's more demand than there is supply, the equilibrium factor is price goes up. When prices start to go up, the money illusion fades off. And lo and behold, we start to go back to where we came. Inflation kicks in. Prices go up. Interest rates follow it up. Asset markets, which have got it overheated, start to sag back to where they were. And ultimately, you end up exactly where you were from a long-run perspective. Now, Mac Milton Friedman points out that there are some long-run consequences of this. One of the big consequences is there's a sharp transfer of wealth away from savers towards borrowers. And of course, that's problematic from a long-run standpoint. And you will also have an issue with investment risk because obviously the uncertainty that comes with returns and, 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 and uh, uh, interest rates as a result of this. So it's not a game you want to do. Now, how does this actually play out in practice? Well, the answer is, is it causes a big surge in household net worth. That kicks off wealth effects. And that's exactly what you saw. And this isn't the first time. In fact, this is the third big asset market cycle we've had in 25 years. The first one was in the late 90s with dot-com. The second one was the subprime nonsense that led to the Great Recession. And now we have Jerome's quantitative easing uh, bubble. This one's a little different than the last ones, though, in as much as the last two, well, the equity bubble was primarily about the top 10%. Subprime was very bad for the bottom 50%. This, mon this QE bubble actually has been very good. It's a, it's a progressive bubble, as the case may be, if there can be such a thing. And the reason this is relevant is you got to remember, you know, you had an overall 30% increase in net worth at the, for the overall housing market, but for the bottom 50%, you saw about 125% increase in net worth. Well, they still is very, very low number. And candidly, wealth inequality is still too high in the United States. But the reason this is an issue, of course, is any kind of income or wealth that goes to the bottom 50% immediately turns into, of course, demand. And that's exactly what we've seen at the national level. An enormous increase in demand, a spending bid, if you will. And you saw it, of course, in the widening of the trade deficit because everybody was trying to buy everything in sight. It's interesting. We had a lot of problems in our ports, and there was a lot of people doing cartwheels trying to say that this was a result of COVID. Well, COVID certainly played some role, but the bigger picture is nothing to do with COVID. It's just that our system for uh, supplying goods to Americans wasn't designed for this enormous surge in demand. And of course, the net result of all this was a big increase in, in inflation. Uh, the PCE peaked at about 7%, it's since cooled off. CPI peaked, peaked at about 9%. And we're not the only economy in the world seeing inflation. A lot of central banks overdid it. And the net result of that is inflation really is a global situation. Again, no surprises here. The only surprise, of course, we run into is what we aren't talking about, right? Because when you hear our policymakers talking about inflation, what do they say? Oh, we printed too much money. That's why we have inflation. Nope. They say things like, oh, it's supply chain issues. It's the federal deficit. It's greedy corporations. Not enough prop manufacturing jobs. Biden's bad green energy policies. Now both parties can agree. Republicans and Democrats get together and agree. It's Putin's fault. What else? Saturn isn't aligned with Jupiter. Kim shouldn't have dumped Kanye. Oh, the Lakers, horrible perimeter defense. I mean, this is all, these last three excuses are just as reasonable as the first six. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. When Milton Friedman said this out loud, he was saying that you cannot have sustained inflation if the money supply isn't there to accommodate it. It's money, people. 
Why can't they say it? Well, again, go back to miserableism. In the DC world, the narrative is about an America who's living hand to mouth. It's living paycheck to paycheck, suffering to get to the end of the mouth. And boy, if the breadwinner in the family breaks a leg, that's it, they're homeless. Um, no, I should point out all this problems, all the fault of the other party. It's all their fault, all their fault, vote for me. Um, obviously, that's nonsensical. Quality of life in the United States has never been better than it is right now for the vast majority of Americans. But again, that doesn't fit with the narrative. And so it gets rejected of out of hand. And you, you can't see it any better than the gasoline situation. In, in the first half of 2022, gasoline prices went up by 50%. And everybody was wringing their hands and talking about how tragic and terrible it was. Uh, but hold on a second. We had a 50% increase in gas prices. That orange line, those orange bars there, pay attention to those. Those are vehicle miles driven in the United States. If this was really all about supply and people were getting hammered, what would you do because of those high gas prices? You drive less, right? Mm -mm, not, not this time. Vehicle miles driven barely went down the tiniest bit. This was all about demand. And all the demand for cars was positive. And we all had to deal, of course, with that TV commercial where the, where the cameras would be rolling on this guy and they'd shove a microphone in his face. How do you feel like filling up your car? Oh, man, it sucks. This administration is the worst. And, you know, the Middle East is terrible. And, uh, yeah, uh, life's tragic. And, and then they go, okay, thank you. And they walk away and they're going, ask the next question. Ask the next question. So where are you going, buddy? <laughs> they never asked that question. Nobody likes putting $120 in your car. But you know what? If you're doing it to go to the lake with your buddies and your boat, maybe it wasn't that big of a deal in the first place. But we don't have these conversations. Again, in this world, you're not allowed to point out the obvious. Look, ultimately, when is inflation going to go away? When prices catch up with the money supply. We're probably over halfway there. We've probably we've seen oh the last year and a half about eleven percent inflation. We're about eight to thirteen percent left to go. A lot of it's going to depend on how fast the economy grows and what else they do at the Federal Reserve level. We don't know exactly, but it's going to run hotter than they're anticipating almost assuredly. What's really weird is again how the Federal Reserve has decided to handle the issue because they haven't gone and tried to oops try to take money away, what they tried to do was raise the interest rate up, which can work, but that's not really the source of the problem. The source of the problem is too much money. And they increased money supply again. At overall, they increased money supply by 36%. And since then, it's come down by 4%. They haven't touched the money supply. So as long as you have all this money sitting out there, we know inflation is going to run hot. It's just a function of how fast it occurs. And the only thing you're doing by raising the federal funds rate is extending the inflation. You're slowing it down now, but you're simply going to have it go on for a longer pace. Because at some point out there, there has to be a re-equilibration between prices and the money supply. Uh, and that means prices are going to go up. And of course, in the very short run, with the increase in federal funds rate, with the in increase in inflation, well, interest rates have popped and the 10 year bond is running about 4%. Mortgage rates are running about 7%. Uh, so, yes, suddenly that's expensive again. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, keep Take a look at those numbers. If you go back, for example, to 2007, mortgage rates in 6% were normal. In fact, they were perfectly reasonable. I would actually argue it's the last decade of these very low interest rates that are really the biggest issues in our world today. They've been too low. We're pushing them back up to where they need to be. But now we got to re-equilibrate. The other place, of course, you're seeing re-equilibration is in the asset markets. The S&P 500 has come down. And yeah, I know your portfolio looks pretty lousy compared to where it did two years ago. But before you complain too much about that, tell me where, how about how it looks relative to four years ago. The answer is you're still up. So in other words, we're giving away cash that didn't money that or wealth that didn't really exist in the first place. This is not a real hit to the economy, as the case may be. Venture capital is cooling off. But again, 2022 was the second best year for venture capital ever. It's 21 that's bizarre. And of course, uh, it didn't make any sense. There wasn't a doubling of good ideas in the US for 2020 to 2021. Some of that money was simply stupid money and almost assuredly will blow up. Yes, fewer 
billion dollar tech funding lineups. And yes, even Bitcoin and FTX and the cryptocurrencies are starting to fall apart. I've been getting a lot of questions about this over the last couple of years, particularly when Bitcoin hit $60,000. What is the fundamental value of Bitcoin? Uh, the answer is zero. I'm, for any of those who are wondering where I come up with that opinion, five letters, P-O-N-Z-I, Italian guy, lived about 100 years ago, look him up. Every generation hopes to go through this. My generation have Beanie Babies. Slightly less dangerous, if you ask me. So with that, this is our break. Roger, uh, time for you to pop up again. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm chuckling at your Beanie Babies. Uh, kind of <laughs> you remember those, so don't you? <laughs> it threw me off a bit as I'm <laughs> chuckling to myself. Here. So again, uh, for our members uh, who are participating, uh, I'm not seeing any questions quite yet. So uh, if you'd like to submit a question about this first section about how we got here, uh, as Chris just uh, discussed his point of view on that, we encourage you to submit those, uh, those questions now, if you have any. And, um, you know, Chris, I, I know you're, you're more knowledgeable about this than I am, which is why I'm going to ask you the tough questions. You know, there's a lot of smart people, uh, you know, economists and, and others uh, out there who, you um, who have a different viewpoint than you did. And let's just stick with this first part about yeah. how did we get here? And I right. think you've alluded to it. I know you spoke about the whole you know, narrative aspects, but I'm just curious if you know, we were doing a kind of debate here, we had you know, uh, a, a, another conference. What do you think is the biggest point they would differ with you on? Just trying to more kind of map out a range of perspectives for our members. What yeah. do you think would be one or two, like, you know, kind of the most material points that they might have a different point of view on um, than you do about how we got to where we are? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I still have a lot of debates with people about, about what I say is excessive, excessive amount of stimulus, right? For example, I had someone challenge me. Well, they had to do something, right? You couldn't just do nothing. And I, and I was like, yeah, I, I get that. But that explains stimulus number one not stimulus number two and three. And it doesn't exp ex explain why when it was abundantly clear by the middle of 2020 that the economy was bouncing back, uh, Jerome Powell decided to do yet another $2 trillion in quantitative easing. So uh, while I appreciate we had to do something, I think we could acknowledge that despite all the evidence that things weren't that bad, they kept doing it, which suggests there was more political motivation for this than there was to economic motivation. Um, as for, you know, a lot of those people, I, yeah, I don't, I d tend not to, shall we say, engage other comments on this stuff because it makes me a little crazy. Um, I will have a few of those comments when we get to this next section. Um, but uh, let me put it this way. So Schiller pointed a finger at economists and say you forgot the narrative. I actually disagree with, with Schiller. I think economists have become part of the narrative. Uh, look, look at someone like Janet Yellen, who is married to George Akerlof, who writes books with Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, who knew Milton Friedman, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, despite the fact that I know she knows this is a monetary phenomenon, she stands at the microphone and goes, oh, we didn't anticipate the war in Russia with Ukraine, right? Huh? But let's keep something in mind. If she wants to keep her job. She has to say that. So yeah. that's helpful. Well, and I, I do see we got a few questions. Let me um, let me just here. I got to kind of uh, just note where we are in time so I can at least keep general track here. Um, yeah. Let me see. There looks like there might be at least um, I don't know one sort of theme, if you will, uh, that goes something like you know that some of our members are you know they're personally seeing that uh, you know higher they're they're experiencing higher gas prices, food and materials, personally, yeah. and in some cases, their business, which is re you know, resulting in, in less money in their, in their pockets. Uh, and this might relate to, you know, our next topic. So maybe- yeah, we I was going to say, I think, I think we're getting ahead about, of our- You know, where things are, where we see inflation going, and yeah. again, kind of where we see prices for these kind of key goods. These aren't, these are needs, not wants, um, you know, kind sure. of- Well, you've got to be careful about that, Roger. I really have a problem with us saying that gasoline is a need, not a want. Some gasoline consumption is a need. Some is a want. 
Yeah, well, like maybe a, the gas like to the there lake. With boat, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe the gas to the lake might be a want, but um, but let's also gas to work or you know to you know to Listen, the grocery store is I, probably need. Well, you actually don't need to go to the grocery store anymore. Jeff Bezos <laughs> will happily deliver anything you want to your front door. Um, so That's even true. there, right? We have to think how much is this is actual need. And you know, listen, you know, one of the things at one point in time, you know, gas prices were six dollars a gallon here, and oh, people in California were losing their minds. We went to Europe last summer. Do you know what gasoline costs in Europe all the time? Six, seven dollars. Yeah. It just does. Um, and by the way, they drive smaller cars. So, you know, when I drive down the road and I see nothing but SUV after SUV after SUV, I wonder, what are we actually doing here? And really, honestly, outside of our, of our, of our, of our friends in Alaska, does everybody in Cal does everybody in LA need an SUV? Not really. So very often we confuse, like for even the conversation of people living hand to mouth, we do these surveys. How many people are living pay to check, paycheck to paycheck? And it turns out their household's making 250K a year living paycheck to paycheck, which begs the question, what are you spending your money on? So, but yeah, let's get into it. We got a lot more slides. Well, yeah, let me, let me just, uh, oh, so a couple of things. I think there's a few questions related to housing prices. I know we're going to get to that, I think, kind that, of that sure. last section. But, you know, just a couple of things let me put on your radar and you can decide, you know, uh, when to address them now or later. Um, I think, you know, see, one is more about, um, you know, the, the whole issue of, do you, what do we see, the odds of having a, a wage price spiral. And then the other one is more about labor markets and especially with people and this and employment rates being yeah. a short low and and, you know, it just seems like there's a number of people who quit working are not coming back in. I, I'm paraphrasing a bit here, kind of that labor participation rate uh, type issue. So those are a couple of the other topics that are coming up. Absolutely. By the way, we did have a, an, we did have one snarky comment in, the, in there. It says, so now economists tells us what we need and don't need. Uh, <laughs> listen, <laughs> I'm not telling you what you need and you don't need. What I am saying is, no matter how you slice it, we live in a pretty damn good time. And when people are making decisions about spending and saving, well, they have to, they have to make some choices. There are trade-offs. The world's full of trade-offs. We have seem to have forgotten that. But let's get right back into it, shall we? Sounds good, Chris. All right. So I got to hurry up here a bit. We're, we're pontificating, and I do want to get us out of here on time. Um, so where are we right now? 2022 wasn't a bad year, right? It really wasn't. 2% uh, growth overall year over year. Consumer spending added most of that. Investment in equipment and intellectual property was up. Yes, in residential structures, it was down. Durables were flat. It was a mixed bag. It certainly was not an economy that was imploding. Now, you got to start with consumers, right? You got to have consumers because consumers are two-thirds the economy. If the consumer's healthy, they can push the rest of the economy through a lot of trouble. So I always start talking about the consumer. And where's the consumer? Well, again, you've heard about inflation, absolutely hammering consumers. You've heard story after story about that. And, you know, we do have some evidence for that. For example, in 2022, we had a record amount of alcohol consumption. And despite the fact that convention business wasn't back, there was a record amount of gambling in Las Vegas. The economy is so bad, it's driving people to drink and gamble. Um, obviously, I'm being facetious, but again, it gets to some of the point of what we're seeing here. A lot of discretionary spending going on out there. This doesn't look like a consumer about to collapse. Now, I could be off on that because you probably heard the news the last couple of months of the year. We had negative growth in retail sales, two months of negative 1% growth. This is the actual graph in the Wall Street Journal. And the reason I bring this up is I want to show you how context is so often Dis just ignored in the paper. This is the Wall Street Journal, which is typically a pretty good publication. But let's scale out. This is retail sales, uh, shall we say, starting through the pandemic and coming into, shall we say, those last couple months of the year. This little bitty decline are those two 1% declines. So is it the consumer about to fall apart? Or is it the fact that we're simply running out of room in our garages? Uh, you have to ask these questions before you start calling the end of the world. 
And by the way, we got the answer in January. It was none of the above because in January, the numbers are started popping again. This is one of the reasons why uh, Jerome Powell is still worried. Autos, we had a lousy year for auto sales. But again, it's not because of a lack of demand. It's because of a lack of supply. The auto industry is still desperately short of inventory. And in December, there were 118,000 cars for sale in the entire United States. In 2015, there was 10 times that many. So if people could actually buy cars, well, we'd see better numbers in GDP. Now, as for the spending and for the flat spending on services, uh, on goods rather, some of this was going back to services. Americans are traveling. We're spending money on restaurants. Uh, if you take a look at some of the airports around California, the numbers are very good. You don't see a consumer driving up. And of course you shouldn't. You know, what's interesting to me is how much we've gone on about one year of inflation. Again, context is helpful. That was one year of inflation after four years of very low inflation. Uh, over the last five years, we've seen about 17% increase in inflation. That's just a little bit above where we were in the middle of 2005. You want to see real inflation go back to the 1970s. In 1979, after five years, of course, there had been a 50% increase in consumer prices. That's inflation. Uh, of course, even the hike in interest rates, most American debt is in the form of a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Lucky us, that's not true in Canada or the UK. And as a result of that, despite the hike in interest rates, U.S. financial obligation ratio, the money we spend, the share of our income we spend on financial obligations is still near a record low level. Now, the pessimists out there are telling us the consumer is going to dry up, is telling you it's all about incomes. After all, savings rates have dropped to 2%. People are spending over their means. Disposable incomes are flat. They're where they were back in 2020. Consumer can't do this. But then again, take a look at the savings rate. Notice that the big decline in saving is occurring after an enormous increase in saving. This is not people getting ahead of themselves. It's catching up with themselves. It's about wealth. It's not about income. And any economist who just looks at income and ignores wealth, they're missing it. Take a look, for example, overall household net worth. Yes, after that big peak, it started cooling off, but we're still up 14 trillion, about 13% from where we were pre-pandemic. That's not too bad. And let's keep in mind, most of that decline is in equity markets, which don't have a big wealth effect because it's owned by the top 1%. It's owned by corporations and it's sitting in 401ks. You want to know what really drives consumer spending? Cash. And this, this number blows me away. This is the Federal Reserve's estimate of household checkable deposits and currency, money you have in your savings or checking account, money you have in a box under your mattress. Prior to the pandemic, a trillion dollars. Right now, five trillion dollars. This is where all the money that, ben, that uh, Jerome Powell uh, fire hosed across the economy landed. It's sitting in people's accounts. And no, it's not just the top 1%. This is an estimate of checkable deposits in index form by income level. And yes, even the bottom 50% has seen a substantial increase in their overall holdings of cash. So there's lots of money out there that will continue to drive overall consumer spending. You're hearing scary stories about credit card debt and delinquencies and auto debt. Only thing that's happening is getting back to normal levels. We're not seeing any new trends here. We went from a record low auto delinquency and credit card delinquency level to one that's more normal. And as this comes back to housing, as far as mortgage debt goes, there's nothing wrong on that particular front. And how about businesses? Where are businesses at? Well, business profits are looking great. And overall, take, for example, here in California, uh, business license applications still elevated from where they were. And this doesn't look like a business sector that's suffering to me. Uh, if you take a look, retail inventory to sales ratios, still really low compared to where they were from pandemic. A good sign of a problem in our economy is when inventories start building up. They're still trying to catch up with what happened over the course of the pandemic. And if you look at the bond markets, again, incredibly clean right now. Ask any business. Most of them will tell you our problem is not a lack of demand. It's a lack of workers. The job openings rate remains incredibly high in the United States right now, about 6.5%. Contrast that to where we were prior to the pandemic at 4.5%. And you look at sectors like healthcare, leisure, hospitality, professional services, these things have enormous job openings. What happened? Well, part of this was long run, part of this was short run. The long run is that this wave was going to come regardless. We knew this because of boomers. Boomers 
all came out of families of 10 kids. That's why they called the boomers, the baby boom generation, because the enormous number of kids ham families had in that post-World War II period. But they apparently were also scarred by that experience. They all went out and had one kid. And our population pyramid quickly turned into a population column. And now, every time a boomer retires, you get one Gen Z coming into the workforce highly reluctantly. Now, this isn't going to change. Take a look at the forecast. This is the census forecast for people 25 to 54 in the United States. It's functionally zero for the next 25 years. Now, what made it immediate was that during the course of the pandemic, about two and a half million people retired. By the way, it's still funny how we continue to see all these crazy stories about what happened to folks in the paper. Oh, it's long COVID. They're afraid to work. They don't have the skills to work. No, they're retired. We know that because we asked them. There is a question in the current population survey. Why are you not in labor force? And the vast majority of people said, because I have retired. And one of the impacts, by the way, of this has been, go back to what I was saying before about the progressive bubble, an enormous increase in earnings for workers, but particularly for low-skilled, low-paid workers. Take a look at some of the numbers there on the left-hand side. The bottom two quartiles of workers are seeing their earnings growth running about 7%, the top 50% about 4.5%. So it's the top 50% that are seeing their income grow slower than, than inflation. The bottom 50% are actually ahead of that particular curve. So if you're worried about income inequality, this is pretty good news. You can certainly see it, of course, in terms of hourly wage earnings for, say, high school degree folks versus those with a bachelor or more. Whoever would have thought that earnings growth for people with a high school degree would have been faster than for people with a, with a college degree. But that is how the world is turning. And of course, where's the downside to this? Run a business. Take a look on the right-hand side. This is growth in weekly earnings for non-supervisory workers. I grabbed two sectors here, construction and logistics, but they've been growing six, seven, eight percent per year, year over year. And again, this is a big challenge for businesses. Payroll numbers are going through the roof and it's hard to do that uh, in this world. Um, now, with that in mind, this goes back to why I'm relatively optimistic about business investment. Because if businesses don't have enough people, what do they have to do? Well, you have to invest in technologies that will allow you to do more with less. So you see spending on software and information processing equipment near the top of the list, you're growing pretty dramatically to deal with labor shortages. So that brings me, of course, to what some of the regional conversation. I realize that we have people from really across the West on this particular call right now. But, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that I know about is, is you know, we always like to do this kind of ranking. Who's ahead? Who's behind? Who's, who's got a better economy? And who's got a worse economy? Who's business friendly? Of course, I live in California, and so I have to deal with our fair mayor running out there to do battle with Florida's mayor and Texas, uh, Texas's governor about who's the biggest, toughest governor around. Paul out to one side. The one thing that unifies every part of this nation, blue and red, rural and urban, inland or coastal, is we all have too many job openings. Um, just take a look at some of these numbers. And what's interesting here is it tell, already tells you a bit of a story. For example, the places that have the worst job openings, Alaska, Wyoming. Alaska has a 10% job openings rate. 10%, it's crazy. California's middle of the pack. Arizona and Washington, which, by the way, are some of the fastest growing states in our economy right now, are near the bottom. What's going on here? Well, you got to stop thinking about jobs as being a function of the health of the economy and more about the supply of labor. Take a look at these numbers here. We know, for example, that you've had the most job growth in these states in Arizona. They're above where they were pre-pandemic. California just got back to pre-pandemic. Place like Alaska, or, or Wyoming have actually seen declining job growth over the last decade or so. But all of these states have heightened job openings right now. What is going on? Well, of course, the answer there is labor force growth or lack thereof. The states that are adding workers are the states that are able to grow their economy right now. It's a completely different situation than what it used to be. And of course, what that means is particularly for the lower paid sector, such as leisure and hospitality, well, these are the places that were emptied out. People, this is California job openings, California jobs. People took jobs in logistics and healthcare, and now they're not going to go back to that leisure and hospitality job. They don't like the hours. They don't like the pay. And as a result of that, some of the sectors that should be bouncing back most rapidly are just unable to get the people for it. I like to say, if you really want to talk about Texas versus California, here's the entire story right here. Why does Texas grow faster in California? 
because they build more housing. Simple as that. California built enough housing to meet demand. We wouldn't, we would be growing as fast as Texas, but don't build it. They won't come. And as a result of that, our economy simply can't grow as fast as those economies that have enough housing. And even within the state of California, you see this picture. Places like Stockton, the Inland Empire, Tulare, Sacramento, Fresno, the inland parts of the state, were, which are often viewed as second-tier economies, have been growing the most rapid since the pandemic came to an end. But these are the places where you've seen growth in labor force. Places along the coast where people moved out of because they want to get away from density, or you had a higher share of people retiring because there's a lot more folks on the edge of retirement along the coast. These are the places that are struggling to come back. And of course, what this means is when you think about economic development in this world, it is no longer about jobs, jobs, jobs. It's about workers, workers, workers. And of course, that means how do we expand our labor force? Well, get poor people to move there. Get the word out. Have more housing. Have more affordable housing. Better school districts, nice parks, all that kind of stuff. Of course, you can also work to get more participation out of your existing labor force. And then last but not least, particularly important for local development agencies is helping companies, particularly mom and pop small companies, do more with less. How do you help them integrate technology into what they do that they can exceed in this strong economy, even with all those job openings? It's a new conversation to be had about how things happen. And with that, Roger, we can jump back into a few. Yeah, that's we great, get into Chris. And so I know we're, you know, we've got another section on housing. So I'm consciously yeah. deferring questions on housing. Let me just hit on, especially with time, kind of uh, two themes that I saw. Yeah. Um, one is just what to expect, in your view, from the equities market in the next couple of years. And two was more about how will the M2 money supply, how will it back, you know, get back into a, a, a more reasonable range? Uh, so those are the two themes. If you can speak right. to that, then we can keep going. Right, right, great. Well, in terms of equity markets, well, first of all, don't ever look at the equity markets and say and think they tell you something about the economy. I mean, they kind of reflect the economy, but they're an extremely warped, bizarre view of the U.S. economy. And so they don't really tell you much what's going on. Um, from a long run perspective, here's what I look at. I, if you look at P ratios in the market, they're high. Simple as that. Even with the declines we see, they're still high from a long run standpoint. To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And ultimately, I think the market has to come down more to get to more reasonable levels. Not to say the corporate profits aren't going to continue to do well. And by the way, I should also point out that if what I just said doesn't mean you should dump your stocks right now. Um, <laughs> look, Keynes, who is one of the most genius people on the planet, pretend had a foundational impact on, on economics, uh, famously said the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. <laughs> so don't even try. Right. And that's even more true in this day, in this era of high speed trading. But yeah, I think it's still overvalued personally. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about M2. Look, Jerome Powell can't do much about M2. Hey, look, if he actually started selling off those bonds in a big way, long run rates would go through the roof. You wouldn't have an inverted yield curve anymore. But wow, I mean, you think the housing market's struggling with 7% mortgage rates now. Where do you see what happens? Not the least of which what's going to happen to government debt rates, which is going to go through the roof. So he's got to be really careful about quantitative tightening, which is why he's not using it very much. He's primarily relying on the federal funds rate. So what does that mean? Well, how do we re-equilibrate? Again, prices keep going up. That's what I said. 8 to 11% more. Now, the question is, is it over two years or is it over four years? Well, if he keeps cranking up the interest rates, it'll be out of four, four years, not two, right? But ultimately, from my perspective, just burn, let it burn out in its own. Stop pretending to do anything because you're not. You're, you're creating more turbulence. You're creating more waves. Do nothing. Let prices go up. They'll settle down by themselves to re-equilibrate. Um, this isn't the 1970s. 1970s, we had ongoing inflation year after year after year because year after year after year, they printed too much money. This time around, it was one. It was one giant dump of cash, and that's it. So it Great. will well, be. And, and I don't know if we have time just briefly. You you mentioned this, I think, more in the wage, uh, wage uh, you know, kind of increase uh, section. Someone's asking about kind of a comment about the skill composition of current labor force 
yeah. versus the skill composition that employers are looking for right. with current job openings. Is there a mismatch there? Or do you have any thoughts about that? And then we can, given well, time, we yeah, probably should actually, move on to housing. Yeah, the most of the job openings are, are in low-skilled sectors, leisure and hospitality, healthcare, <laughs> right? Now you say, wait, healthcare is not low, no skilled. The parts of healthcare that are empty are low skilled, right? You got to remember what's interesting about healthcare. We always think about doctors. They're a tiny portion of the healthcare industry. Doctors and nurses are a small pair of it. I'm talking about all the aides and all the people who do all that hard work in those hospitals. Yeah. Those are the jobs that aren't getting filled. Teacher aid spots are going to get filled. It's impossible to get childcare because those jobs aren't getting filled. What's happening here, of course, is that workers that have opportunities are taking them. They're moving up. They're taking careers. You hear a lot that, you know, during, not so much now, but a year and a half ago, you would hear this. Oh, the reason we have labor shortages is because we gave people too much money, right? And the argument being that you got a bunch of lazy Americans sitting around spending their stimulus checks and not looking for a job, to which I point out, there's a big difference between I don't want to work and I don't want to work here. You know, we live in a period of time where employers have to deal with labor shortages, which means you got to step up, you got to compete. You got to give them the packages. You got to give them the training. And because there is an unprecedented opportunity for, shall we say, getting an actual career path, the actual, you know, 10 years ago, educating low skill workers didn't work out that well because there were people with skills already who were looking for that job. Now we're so devoid of people that training people, training low skilled people is pays off better than ever before. Another great opportunity for local economic development. The key here is how do we fill those low-skilled positions? And the answer, I would argue, is one of two things, or some combination of the two, which is more immigration and more machines. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I, you know, I know, and I apologize, we can't get to every question, but uh, we'll see how we can do. We are going to try to get to the housing topic next. And well, we're so, going to uh, jump right in because we're already hitting six o'clock. Yeah, we are. So uh, and that's my yours, Chris, let's talk about housing. All right, do it. Uh, look, housing, terrifying. Sales are down. Prices are falling a little bit, not much. Uh, inventories, new homes for sales are, and you, of course, have all these scary predictions of a housing market about to melt down. Uh, and you certainly see that. Take a look at some of the numbers. Uh, yes, California prices got above 800,000, and now they're down about 750,000. Washington, 650 down to 600. Uh, I get it, right? But this is not 2007. You know, it's interesting about the housing meltdown from 2000 to 2010. It had nothing to do with interest rates. It had everything to do with oversupply and too much bad debt. Well, this market is all about interest rates. Look, two things happened here. First thing that happened was because of all that cash and the very low interest rates we saw, housing took off like nobody's ever seen. The numbers over the last those couple of years are off the charts. Take a look, from July 20 to July 2022, Phoenix, 62%. Vegas, 50%. Portland, 33%. San Francisco, 35%. Denver, 40%. The numbers are insane. Now, of course, people are going crazy, throwing money at everything. Interest rates from 25 to 7%. And we went from an incredibly overheated market to one that's cooling off simply because of a sticker shock. But with that in mind, this is not going to be a market that melts down because the conditions that are truly dangerous for housing, that is to say, too much debt, particularly too much subprime debt, and of course, too much supply, those conditions don't exist right now. Take on the left-hand side here. This is debt and equity in one to four family homes. Uh, you know, you saw a big increase in debt in the early part of uh, the run-up to the Great Recession. We went from $5 trillion over $10 trillion, a doubling of debt levels in, in, in a decade in the U.S. Over this last decade, debt levels have barely budged, and the debt is very clean. This is a cash bubble. And we went from having $8 trillion in equity in 2011 to $30 trillion at the end of 2022. This market is insanely rich in equity. And as for supply, well, again, while the supply of new homes for sale is going up, and certainly sales of existing homes are going down, there's no buildup of an inventory in the existing home market. Overall, a month's supply of existing homes is uh, still below four months, incredibly tight. Vacant units for sale, incredibly low. Overall vacancy rates, substantially lower in this uh, it, relative to we were pre-pandemic. So this is a market that is really uh, indicated by incredibly, incredibly tight supply. Why? 
two major issues. One, we had a very, very weak cycle for overall single family housing completions, probably because of miserableism. But then also we saw an expansion of households during the pandemic. Uh, apparently when we were forced to live together uh, for three months, some of us realized we didn't like the people we live with. And as a result of that, we already had a tight market. We absorbed one and a half million empty units. And today, of course, we have an incredibly tight market. So yeah, for example, the units being sold at a listing price going down, you're not seeing those bidding wars, but look at months of supply on the left-hand side there. These markets are incredibly tight. And what that means, of course, is a different kind of meltdown. In 2010, the big problem in US housing was there wasn't enough buyers. In 2023, the big problem is gonna be not enough sellers. So a different kind of problem, and certainly not one that suggests massive foreclosures and massive declines in prices. And by the way, it also explains another phenomenon. Remember that what you have here in the US is an incredibly strong apartment market. What's going on there? Well, think of all the people that would like to get into housing, but because there's no supply, interest rates are up, well, they're in apartments. And the apartment market is seeing falling vacancy rates, rising rents, huge number of starts in, in apartment buildings, all, of course, to just catch up with current demand. So now it's not that kind of housing cycle. It's going to be a different kind of thing. You have very tight vacancy rates across the board. The housing, the, the apartment market is starting to cool off. We got to be fair about that. You saw rents really start to top off near the end of 2022. We have a lot of new stuff coming online in some parts of the U.S., and that will take some of the heat off. But again, remember, you're dealing with an enormous overall housing shortage in the United States, not just in California, it's really everywhere. And that, of course, means that this is still a supply-driven market. You can still make money by building, but you have to build stuff that people don't move up into. That's what I meant by a collapse of filtering. Not too many people are going to buy a nice new fancy home in their city and sell their existing one because it means going from a 2.5% mortgage to a 7% mortgage. But for those who want to jump in, there's still room for building the old-fashioned kind of entry-level housing, like townhouses. And yes, there will continue to be good demand for apartments as, of course, the market is frozen and the single-family side for a number of years. It isn't about affordability. And ultimately, of course, from a long-run standpoint, if you really want to talk to builders and say, what's the problem? The problem you're facing from a long-run perspective is not that interest rates are high. The real problem you have is a slowdown in population growth. You know, ultimately, you want to look out 10, 11 years when population growth continues to slow more and more, then the real question is going to be is where is the demand for housing going to come from in that particular world? And there won't be as much. But again, this is a conversation about changing our immigration system. And of course, in this world, not a lot of conversations on that front. So we got that, that pretty quick, Roger. So uh, how about some questions on that particular? We did. Well, let me go yeah. back. I'm not, um, uh, we had some earlier ones. I think one of the questions, and you may even hear the answer, but if you could just speak to it a little bit is, sure. um, you know, we have a, a, a couple of members wondering about, so about whether or not they should invest in real estate. You know, is there a, you know, right now, or should they wait? Or, you know, how should they, they think about that in the context of, of what you see? I, you know, it depends what you're going to invest in, would be my answer, and why you're going to do it. Say, for example, right, right now, I continue to see activity, uh, say even in, on the, let's not talk so much about on the single family ownership side. On that one, I think you probably should sit. Um, but let's say you want to think about investing in apartment buildings. Is there a value there? Well, what's weird right now is, you know, there still are transactions going on, even at these higher interest rates. And the reason for that is there's just a certain amount of momentum in the market driven, if nothing else, been by 1031 exchanges and people trying to lock in on some of their capital gains. So you have a situation where people are like, OK, I got a bunch of cash and I can do one of two things. I can go out and buy a building that maybe has a negative cap rate to start with. But at the same time, I'm avoiding capital gains. And so if you look at if you just look at the raw numbers out there, they don't make a lot of sense to buy an apartment building right now. It, but if you're trying to protect yourself from capital gains on something else you sold, you may be forced into buying it anyway. So, again, lots of equity out there. The capitulation is happening slowly. I, for one, I would argue that you're probably better off looking at investing in ground up stuff right now. Right. And staying away from the resale market, unless, of course, you're in that peculiar position of having some capital gains you're trying to avoid. Um, but definitely room on that, on that uh, uh, say, building 
for the entry level stuff, building apartments, building condos, that kind of stuff. Builders have opportunities, but you know, in some places it's hard to build entry level housing because fixed costs are so high. So, uh, you know, uh, I even talked to like local policymakers. You you say you want to grow your economy. You know, a lack of labor force is a critical issue. This is the time to back off the fees, to back off the taxes, to back off all the things you charge builders when they're building housing. This is the time to get those fixed costs down so they have an opportunity to build the stuff that people can and will move into at this particular point in time. So yes, you can still invest. It's not going to be a complete meltdown, but the slow capitulation means the returns are just going to be a little bit ugly over the next few years. Great. Thank you. And do you see the new construction supply particularly? Um, do you see any indications that's going to improve? Because, and we see this ourselves in our mortgage business, you know, talking to members who are looking for them, you know, inventory is tight in almost every market that we're in. Do you see that new construction, you know, supply uh, changing anytime soon? You know, it's funny because it's, multifamily is doing fine. Multifamily construction is okay. Single family is kind of leveled out. I, I did a talk with uh, Shea Holmes not too long ago, and they were surprisingly optimistic. They feel like things are starting to crack a little bit. You know what a lot of buyers need, particularly first-time buyers, is they just need some stability, mm. right? They just want to know the mortgage rates are going to be here for a bit. And, and that goes back to one of my comments I made earlier about Jerome Powell. And now he's talking, oh, we got to fight inflation. We got to raise those interest rates more. No, you don't, chief. <laughs> You're just making it worse. Sit in your hands. Do nothing. Unfortunately, I don't, I'm not on the little red phone with uh, Jerome. He hasn't called me. <laughs> really. Perhaps, perhaps because I call him Jerome. Maybe he doesn't like that. I don't know. So anyway, um, so yeah, I, I think you got to move cautiously. Like, I think I move cautiously in all the asset markets. And for people who are you know, thinking about the future, that can be uncomfortable. It can be frustrating. Um, my argument is, look, you, you got to tread cautiously in this market. Very, very cautiously. There's always opportunities. Do your homework. Run your numbers. Be careful what you're, you're getting into. You need to be more cautious now than ever before. The one thing I can say is, um, look, at some point in time, um, <sighs> What, what does somebody say? You, you, you marry a house, but you date the mortgage, <laughs> right? Remember, you can get into it now at a high interest rate. If it does come down a bit in a few years, you can go out and refinance. So, you know, it, some people just need to get into a house. I have a new job in a new part of the world. I, my wife's about to have a kid and we need a baby room. Yeah. Yeah, you just got to do what you need. do. So, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. Well, and I know I apologize for uh, the folks who submitted questions. We couldn't get to all of them. We actually are uh, even a little over time that we had planned. So I really appreciate uh, Chris's uh, indulgence. I think this is some great information, great Absolutely. perspectives to consider. Before we, uh, I make maybe a, uh, just a brief closing comment, Chris, is there anything else you wanted to share as you wrap up? Yeah, well, just, yeah, just a quick, Summary, look, the expansion is going to continue. Asset prices are going to continue to go fall down. Asset liquidity is going to continue to be reduced. Inflation will run a little bit hot. But I think as long as the Federal Reserve sits in their hands, rates are going to settle down. We're probably going to see some stability there. Remember, wealth and income are going to continue to drive consumer spending. Wealth and income inequality are falling, which are good things. Um, and while you know I don't see a recession, let's be aware that the economy is a little brittle right now. Um, for me, it's looking ahead. What could offset this? Where are the worry points? If you always like, well, that's nice. You gave a good picture. But what are you worried about? Well, I'm worried about the Fed. All right. I, I've already said that. I, I, They haven't pursued what I would call logical policies in the last couple of years. And it isn't clear to me they're going to pursue a logical policy this year. Um, we do have to worry about the, the long-run fiscal situation. We have a national debt level that's incredibly high and absolutely no conversation in D.C. about what to do about it. Uh, we have a global situation. You got China and their real estate problems. You got Russian, Russian aggression. That none of this is pretty. Well, how do we deal with labor shortage issues? Again, a complete, it's not even a question in DC, which is one of the things that most frustrates me, which brings me, of course, to the big idea that their biggest problem here is this gap between economic reality and political narratives, still dangerously wide. And when I think at the local level, it's amazing how many local governments I talk to. And the local governments are still focused on this idea that we have to rescue our citizens. 
Rescue them for what? I don't know, but they're going to rescue them. And I like to go back. You, you got to put that away. People are fine. It's time to go back to doing the bread and butter stuff. You know, getting building permits out on time, making sure the sidewalks don't have holes in them, making sure your kid has a good education in public school. It's time to go back to competing for business. Not so much pointing the finger at business and telling them somehow or other they're bad for the economy. Um, this is the kind of change in narrative we need to see. And, you know, it's interesting is it's easy to point a finger at Washington, D.C., but I like to point out that politicians live or die on capturing the narrative, right? How do you get elected? You grab the right narrative. So if they're saying things that we don't like, understand that these are the narratives coming from us. We have to start. We have to be the ones to start shifting the narrative at the ground level, right? Because when we shift the narrative, eventually politics will catch up, but it has to start with us. And, you know, one last thing, and, and I just, this is just a yeah, problem with narratives. It's easier to fool people than it is to convince them they have been fooled. Um, be skeptical, be curious, people. Don't look at the headline and just assume it's real. Please go out, have a good year, avoid the weapons of mass distraction. And with that, Roger, I think we can call it an evening. Well, Chris, thank you so much for sharing uh, your great uh, information and perspectives. Really, really valuable. Uh, and again, thank you to our uh, member and owners who were uh, able to join us uh, today. Really appreciate your engagement, your questions. Try to get to as many questions as we could. We'll send out the recording and you have the QR code opportunity to get Chris's the slides uh, directly. Also, I just want to uh, invite you to our, our next um, economic forecast uh, in, in our series, which is going to be on June 8th, and we'll provide more information on that. So again, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Great job in the presentation. And to all of our members who were able to join us, thank you very much. We appreciate your business. We appreciate you, your time this uh, afternoon, evening, depending on your time zone here. So thank you all. Have a nice evening.